How many of you uh, can remember back when you were a kid ever going to Sunday school? You remember that? You can raise your hand. You're, I know you're Baptist, but get your hands in there. All right. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of like a kid's Sunday school lesson. This was the first time I heard it. And uh, my mother taught this to me, of course, hearing it in vacation Bible school and hearing it in Sunday school. It's about a guy named Zacchaeus. And we even learned a song. I don't know if you, probably everybody knows that Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Put this to music, I'll be my first special ever in the church. But you know, um, it's a great story, and we're going to go through that today. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 19, go through and we'll read some verses and comment on them and just find out the story of Zacchaeus. And this morning I'm just going to tell you the story about Zacchaeus and who he was and, and, and that wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, Luke chapter 19. We're going to, and we're, I'll read a few verses and comment on them. And, uh, and I'm going to read them. I'm not going to say them from memory, okay? I'm going to read them. Too much pressure. So we'll go to the, uh, have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us to come to meet in your house uh, for the blessings you've already given us, Father. Uh, you're a wonderful God. You're a mighty God. We lift you up this morning in honor and in praise, and we recognize who you are in your deity your awesomeness lord we thank you for allowing us just to be in your presence and we ask these things in christ's name amen, amen. there are people in our world today and uh, all i have to do is turn on television or look around us and even look at ourselves um <clears throat> some people really look we look at them and they look like they possess everything the world has to offer and sometimes we envy those people man they got it together they got possessions they've got family and a lot of times we as as people and even in our society will judge people based on their possessions or their power um we look at uh a president or a king or or a politician or an actor or a uh a musician or whatever it may be and and man they just got it all together they've got the world you know at their feet and perhaps like I said, there might have been times in our life that we have had envy of like, man, if I just had this, or if I just had an extra few dollars, or if I just uh, could get to the end of this road, if I could just be like this person or that person, or I wish I could just be more like um, this family member. I think we've seen that in our family. You ever had that in your family? If I could just be more like my brother, yeah. or more like my sister, or more like my dad, and, and things like that. Well, there's this character named Zacchaeus, and he was a little man that was about to meet a big, big God. And that's, that is the message uh, titled today, A Little Man That Meets a Big God. And yet <clears throat> Zacchaeus had all these things. He was a wealthy, wealthy man, a man of power. Uh, even though he had a small stature about him, he was a man of great prominence and position and power. And, but when we look at Zacchaeus, as the old adage goes, not everything kind of was like would meet the eye, I guess you could say, about his life. Sure, he was successful by the world's standards, What's the old thing? You can never judge a book by its cover. And you look at Zacchaeus and you thought he had it all together. And if you would have sat down and talked to him, his life was a disaster. And it's funny, I think as Americans, uh, even in our national anthem, we talk about being the land of the free. And I, am, I, I love being American. I am proud of my heritage. I'm proud of uh, family. We're Europeans. That came, we, were, we were poor, uh, basically farmers and preachers. And we're still poor not so much farmers, but a lot of preachers. And they came over, you know, and they set roots in this country, and actually we traced our family heritage back to the early 1700s. So proud of that. But you know what? It pales in comparison to my relationship to God. First and foremost, I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm a minister of the kingdom of God. I'm part of the bride of Christ. I'm part of the family of God. And that's more important even than my American heritage or my family heritage. And I think a lot of times we think America is the land of the free. Brother Andrew talked about walking the streets down here. I've had the opportunity to do that myself. Uh, being from the, the Detroit area, I uh, saw some of the same things. But you know what? It didn't matter if you were in the inner city or if you were in suburbia or middle class America or upper middle class America or rich America. There's a lot of people around this country that are walking around that are not free. That's right. They're in bondage to whether it be their job, whether it be to drugs, whether it be to alcohol, whether it be to an idea, whether it be to a movement or whatever. We have a lot of people in this country right now involved in movements. We have the PETA people about their animals rights and we have the earth people about preserving the earth and global warming and they're married to a cause and they're still not free. 
Because, and Zacchaeus was in this boat. He, he was aligned with the Roman government, a man of power, a man of stature, a man of great wealth, and he was imprisoned to his own sin. And I'm here to tell you today that if, you, if you're looking for liberty and freedom, you are not going to find it in the United States of America. Oh, Scott, that's treasonous, you know. Unless you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will never have liberty and you will never have freedom. Because right. you will never be free from yourself. I've seen people change the place they live, their address, to go to, to get a fresh start. And they keep running and running and running to look for that brass ring, but they can't get away from themselves. Until that condition of the heart is changed and they are reconciled with God, nothing's going to be different. And we're going to talk about this man that's a great example of this. And it's, it's about time that we got to the point, and join me as we watch this little man meet a big God. First thing that we see in Zacchaeus in his life, starting in chapter 19, is uh, we have a sinner who is actually seeking something in his life. And we're going to read about that. And notice what it says as you read with me. We'll read the first four verses. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans. Notice that he was a chief among the publicans. He was a, a high-ranking government official, a tax collector for the Roman government. And he was rich. I love the Bible, the, plain, the plainness of the Bible. Not only was he a, a publican, not only was he a high-ranking official with the Roman government, but boy, he was rich. Okay, Verse 3, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Uh, we have this man of prominence. He's a sinner who's seeking to see Jesus. I want to point out something before we get into this. I want to kind of put this in perspective when this happened. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and it was right at Passover time. And he was about to make his, his entry, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which was actually a picture of the, his millennial reign. And they were going to put palm branches and things down, and he was going to pass through there on, on a donkey. And he, this is the journey to do that. But what the world didn't know at that time, on his entry to Jerusalem, he wasn't going to leave the same way he entered. He was actually going to be nailed to a cross and become our Passover for sin. And what's remarkable about this is he's going to take time during this great event that's going to affect the whole world to make time for this one man named Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. It's funny to me as Christians, and as a minute, I get busy. You know, you have a full-time job, and, and, and these things go on, and, these, and I'm going to tell a story on myself. It's a friend of mine, and, and we were working on a project together. And we were, we were painting, and I'm very task-oriented, man. I mean, I get tunnel vision, got to get the job done. And even at work, I, I'm very analytical. I got tunnel vision, got to get this done, and I can sit down and do something and not be distracted for hours. And my wife can attest to this, you know, it's like a freak, you know, just bam, don't talk to me. And this young man started asking me questions about the Bible. And we're, and we're painting this fence, it's an iron fence, and we're working on it or whatever. And I'm like, what's he jabbering for? We got to get the fence done. So I went in the house, I told Robin, she goes, he's trying to talk to you about the Bible. And then it, the, the light bulb went off. Oh, I need to get out there and talk to him about the Bible. <laughs> Jesus was not quite as dense as I was. Nowhere near it because he's going to take time on his way to Calvary to take time for Zacchaeus. He had to kick me in the behind to get me to do what I was supposed to do as a minister. That's the difference between us and Christ. He's at task. He's about the, the person that's in front of him. He doesn't get sidetracked by everything else that's going on. He, he was right to the task of a meeting with Zacchaeus, and it was purpose that he would do that. So we see in verse, uh, in verse 2 that, that Jesus, or verse 1, he's going to enter and pass through Jericho, and there was a, a man there named Zacchaeus, his ch uh, chief among publicans. So we see this man ha has prominence. He's a man of position. He was a tax collector. He worked for Rome. He was permitted to extract taxes from the people. Uh, let's say Rome's tax rate was 10%. Zacchaeus could take anything over that that he wanted for himself. So if he taxed you 20%, uh, he'd give 10% to the Romans, keep 10% for himself. He had a pretty good gig going on right now. So we can say that it meant that he was a man of considerable wealth. The Bible says he, that he was rich. He was a man of power. So I look for Kleenex. I'm not hiding on you. I'm just going for Kleenex. We got some. He was a man of power. By the virtue of his position and of his, uh, his contact and connections to Rome, Zacchaeus was a man of great power in Jericho. 
And, and, and you can look at our own society and, and figure that out. So I'm going to, in America, as great as it is, is it a safe assumption to assume the people with the most power are also the people with the most wealth? Money talks. I mean, we could probably agree to that. Um, can you remember the last time that we had a president of the United States that wasn't filthy rich before he went into office? I mean, money buys power, buys political connections. Zacchaeus was a man like that. Um, I'm sure he was envied and I'm sure he was feared. Man, he has got connections. You don't mess with Zacchaeus. He's got money. You don't mess with Zacchaeus. And here's the funny thing. Who was seeking who that day? We're going to figure that question. Think about that. Who was actually seeking who that day? This man of power, uh, like I said, a very small man in stature, but probably very feared. In verse 3, read the first part of that. It says, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press. He had, we have a man of prominence, a man of position, a man of, uh, uh, of power, but a man that was preoccupied. Something's going on inside of Zacchaeus. Okay? Even though the man was wealthy and successful by the world standard, you know what? He knew something was missing. I think as a minister and sometimes even from a church standpoint, you can't always judge a book by its cover. You know, we need to be sensitive to people's needs and, and to see if they're preoccupied. There's something going on in their life. Do we need to sometimes to step back from ourselves and our lives to spend a little bit more time with somebody for the cause of Christ? Just to be there with them and listen to them. Um, we find that he was missing something. I'm going to ask you this. Aren't most people missing something? Anybody in here totally complete in everything that you can possibly ever be? Have you hit that status yet? Isn't it great that we're not? Because we're a work that God's working on to bring it. You know what he's doing? He's bringing to us to a point of completion as a child of God. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll never be complete. Can you imagine living eternity without Jesus Christ in your life and never, never being complete and being separated from God? And, and what he's doing, he's working on us to make us complete. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that sometimes it hurts. It, it's painful sometimes as a man to look at myself and, and, and find out everything that I'm not. You know what? When I compare myself to Jesus Christ, we talked about Zacchaeus being a wee little man. I'm a wee little man compared to Jesus Christ. Um, there was a great wrestler. Anybody watch wrestling? We got any secret wrestler watch? Okay. All right, man. Here we are, Andre the Giant. Oh, everybody knows Andre. I want to tell you another secret. In Detroit, there's a place called Cobo Hall. And that's where all the wrestling, back then it was wrestling. That's where all the wrestling happened. And Robin and I, when we first, were we married or were we just dating? Dating. dating. And she still married me. We went and saw Andre the Giant at Cobo Hall. And all the wrestlers walked by and there was this little platform that was like the entryway for the wrestlers. And you could look down and see the top of their heads. And here comes Andre. And he looks over and he's at eye level with us. Like, Andre's big. You know what? Even Andre the Giant was dwarfed in his stature compared to Jesus Christ. Right. We're all we little people compared to Jesus Christ in our stature and our power and our prominence and everything about us, we are small compared to Christ. We are a speck on the map. Yep. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus Christ can look upon us and see us and look at the intent of our heart and the condition of our heart and know us intimately. We're never too small for him not to take concern or to take and look at us as far as an investment in our lives. And we're an investment for God. He's investing something in us. He paid a great price to be a part of our life. Uh, we see here that something's missing with Zacchaeus. And in all of us, there's something missing. They try to drown themselves sometimes, even these people that are um, very powerful in position. We read a, a scripture today in James that talked about when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Even the greatest people in the world... Um, are going to die. Yep. And we find that a lot of times, even in, in, in look around us at, at actors or, or, or even great ministers who, have, who have, have built themselves up as being this great minister or voice of God, and we find out that, that some of them turn out to be cult leaders like a Jim Jones or a David Koresh, and they, they build themselves up and they're looking for, for all this type of thing. They're looking for power and position, and we find that a lot of times they start drowning themselves in secret and alcohol. They get lost in a fog of drugs. They bury uh, a lot of times himself in a shallow grave of bravato. You ever hear the guys that are really boisterous and they have tough talk and, and they're, boy, they're intimidating, but on the inside they're failing and they're looking and they're preoccupied because something just isn't right. Yeah. 
And if they continue down the road, the Bible says, you know what? Sin's going to lead to death. Jesus Christ leads to eternal life. I am standing before you that if uh, I'm going to tell another story. Robin and I, we, she gets to travel with me for my job, which is really a blessing. I mean, we have a really, really good time. And if you know us and you get to know us better, uh, for 100 miles, I'll talk. And for five miles, she'll say, yes, dear. And then I'll start continuing the conversation. And then I'll say, well, I really talk a lot. But I was sharing with her the other day, you know, God, and it's just the way it is. <laughs> God in my life, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that I want to drop dead tomorrow. But if I found out right now that I had a terminal illness and it was, you know what? I could look at my Lord and say, you know what? Um, you give me everything that I needed. There is something about as you grow in grace and you become a Christian and God starts to grow you, and I was talking to Brother Nick about this, your worldview starts to change. Because you know what? He's been sufficient for everything. I sleep like a baby at night. I have, um, he's blessed me in every avenue you can imagine. I don't have the stress about, gee, what's tomorrow going to break? You know what? It doesn't matter because you know what? My faith is in Jesus Christ. And it's not because I've got it all together. It's because who I put my faith in has it all together. Right. And Zacchaeus was so, had all this power and position and prominence, and he was so preoccupied because, you know what? I'm, something's not right. Something's not right in here. The loud bravado and the tough talk and, and everything, we hear a lot in politics and um, in our own country, um, people with loud voices. But you know what? When it gets quiet and there's no one around but you and God, I think the truth sometimes gets really loud in your soul. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you had a moment where you've been alone and quiet and you've gone one-on-one -on -one with just God and addressed your sin? Yeah. Because you know what? He can get your attention. He, there's physical things that you could do to me that would be very painful, but it pales in comparison about what God can do to me spiritually that even goes beyond what my body could take. When you get alone with him and he shines that light and your sin becomes real and you realize what you are and you come clean with him about, and it's amazing. I think you almost pray for the judgment. God, I deserve hell. I deserve your judgment. Yeah. And when you come clean and you get to that point with him and what he, what he does is remarkable, makes no sense at all to me. He unloads his grace upon you. Right. You finally got it. You finally turn loose of that pride. Here's Zacchaeus, a very small man. And I think it was going on inside him. He heard that voice. I think it was probably the blast of a thousand trumpets. You know, something that going on inside him. Zacchaeus, there's something that you need to have. You don't understand. You need to have this. And, and he's probably losing his mind trying to figure this out. Those who really care about their souls are going to do something about it with Christ. The most valuable thing that you have with you today is not in your pocketbook. It's not the clothes you're wearing on your back. It's your soul. It's the very thing that God sent Jesus Christ for was to resurrect was make live new souls because you know why he's going to take that soul give it a glorified body and make you into the image of Christ which is the ultimate will of God for humanity we are not like some religions say that you know what uh, you know brother Bo you're gonna we're, we're, we're gonna make you a you're gonna be a new God you're gonna have deity and and you'll have your own planet someday and man it's you know what he's gonna do he ain't going to do none of that. He's going to take Brother Bo as the saved child of God, and he's going to make him like Jesus Christ was in his humanity. He's going to make him the exact perfect Brother Bo. You're pretty good already. But Lord's got a lot more stuff he's going to do for you, you know. And can you imagine that? A God that, that, that loves you on a personal level so much that, you know what, I'm going to change you and make you like Jesus Christ was in his humanity. Perfect. I'm going to be satisfied with you. And here's the key. You're not God. I'm not going to make you into a God. There's one God. There's always going to be one God. We're not it. God cannot be created. For, uh, he's God because he's eternal. One of many things we talked about is attributes today. Eternal is one of his attributes. So there's no beginning, no end. Brother Andrew, I agree with you. I don't get that. You know, I'm thinking about tomorrow and yesterday and God, everything, everything just is. I don't even know what that means, I think. I can say it, but it doesn't compute. But here's Zacchaeus, and, and he's just in turmoil. And he's heard about this man named Jesus, and he's, he's got a desire now. And I've got to see, I, I just got to at least see this man and put my eyes upon him. The Bible says that he, he sought to see Jesus. In verse 3, the second part of that, it says um, that he uh, could not for the press because he was little of a statue. 
a stature. And in verse 4, And he ran before him and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. He had a desire to see Jesus. The man had a desire to see the Lord. I think I've talked to many people that go through years in their life, and they don't want anything to do with the Lord. That's a sad, sad place to be. I've had people tell me that. Don't want nothing to do with God. Zacchaeus was a little bit different. He had something going on inside him that he had at least cast his eyes upon Jesus. Um, I don't know your situation today. Maybe you go through many years in your life life and didn't want anything to do with the Lord. Um, But I always wonder when there is that realization in your soul, that realization that Jesus is your only hope, would that drive you to want to see him too? I really believe that every person is faced with that knowing that Jesus is their only hope. And they either accept it or reject it. Salvation is not a difficult thing as many religions would put upon you that you have to do so many works and you have to do the sacraments and you have to do this. You know what it comes down to? Let's put all the religious stuff aside. It becomes a, a, a situation, we talked about this in Sunday school, between you and God. Sure. Nobody else, we talked about not playing the blame game, but just between you and God and what are you going to do at that moment. Yep. Think about what he is. We are not God, but yet an almighty God just like Zacchaeus uh, is going to pass our way. And what are we going to do with that moment in our life? As Christians, after we're saved, what do we do with the impact of God in our life? Do we allow God to grow us, or do we decide, you know, I need to do this my own way? Um, I've been at ministry a long time, and I've done a lot. I tell you what, I've just been perfect. Oh, man, I've been smooth. My wife is over there laughing at me. I have made things a mess when I try to do it my own way. The best points, the highlights of my ministry is when I've been, Lord, what would you have me to do? Yep. What would you have me to do? And boy, he shows things that happened to me and through me. And what happens, I've had people say, well, you know, you go see this person, what a blessing you'll be to them. You know, it's not like that at all. What happens is they become a blessing to you. God does a work in their life. He is so benevolent, so gracious. That what it, here's, here's Scott, here's the ministry part of it. I'm going to allow you to enjoy the work I'm doing in their life. And you don't deserve it. And boy, if that don't humble you as a minister, you need to get your humbler fixed, you know? Because he, he does these things, and there's just no, no reasoning behind it. Because as people, we'd be lucky to do that for somebody that we love, much less somebody that's, re, that's basically uh, cursed our name and sinned against us. But he had a desire, Zacchaeus does. He had a desire to see the Lord. And I'm hoping that, that you have that same desire here, that you want to commune with him. If you're not saved, that you, you want to seek Jesus and have Jesus be part of your life. And if you're here and you're a Christian, my, my desire would be that you would have such a desire to get to know him even better. That you want to see, you know, Lord, I want you to change my life every day. I want you to make me more and more like Jesus every day. I think there's a song that says, that more more like jesus yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna get special out of me yet but you know what he wants to make you more like jesus he had a desperate need here's this man with all the money and i'm sure that everything he tried to acquire was to try to fill a need in his life you ever notice have you known people have you ever been in a situation in your life to whatever you have is just not quite enough and if you just get that next car, that next this, that next that, or that next pretty shiny thing, or the iPhone 8, 10, 11, 12, 15, z- uh, whatever, that that'll complete me and everything will be great and you get that and it's just not enough. Regardless of what Zacchaeus obtained in his life, it just wasn't enough. And here's why. Here's a, uh, I'm going to lay some heavy theological stuff on you, okay? We were created to live forever. Death was brought into the world, not by God, but by man. The spirit that dwells within you, even though this body is going to go to the grave, is going to live forever. It's going to live either in heaven or hell. But you're going to have an existence somewhere forever. We have temporal things all around us, things that we can see, things that we can touch. And what we try to do is to satisfy this spirit within us with things we can get our hands on. Money. Um, If that doesn't work, maybe a a quick high from a drug or alcohol. Uh, People that run up debt like crazy. They go out and they shop like crazy because it makes them feel good. And pretty soon they're in debt up to their eyeballs and they can't pay it off. But you know what? They go out and increase whatever it may be. We have sicknesses and isms and tisms for everything in the world. Uh, The Bible calls it sin, by the way. And so what happens is they try to fill this, this void inside them with all these temporal things. And the only thing that can fill that void is the Spirit of God. Because He's the only thing that's eternal. You cannot satisfy an everlasting spirit with temporal things. 
things that are fading away or last. The only thing that's going to satisfy that drug addiction, that's going to take that away, is the Spirit of God to replace it. What happens to the drug addict? What happens when the buzz wears off? I've got to get more drugs. I've got to get back on this. It's a spiritual problem. Yep. Until the Spirit is dealt with, the addiction is going to sit there and control you, and you're never going to be free. That's right. if, if you're in trouble with alcohol, until the Spirit of God takes control of your life, and you're desperate for that need like Zacchaeus was, and it takes control of your life and fills that need, you're always going to go back to that bottle. That's right. If you're hooked on pornography, our, our sexual deviation, you're going to continue to go back and go back and go back until, guess what, until it kills you. How many people you know that have been caught up in drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be, and they did it knowing it would kill them, but continue to go back to the well? Yep. Here's, a, here's a news flash for everybody out there who doesn't believe in who God is and whatever, and the Bible's an old book. You know what? This book tells you that. Yep. If you continue in sin, you will die. Yep. The Bible says, you know what? You want filled with the Spirit, you want a true life, you want a life pleasing to God, you want a life that makes you happy, allow the Holy Spirit to change you. Yep. It's called rebirth, born again. The Bible says you cannot see heaven unless you are born again. It came from the words of Jesus Christ. He had a desperate need. Zacchaeus may not have fully understand what was happening in his heart and his life. Here's a, I was, I, you've heard this a million times and you hear me preach, you'll hear it a million more. It's my testimony. How, does anybody know how old I was when I was saved? Eight. Eight. Amen. You guys, listen. You know what? I am so happy about that day. You're going to keep hearing it. Because he changed my life that day. At eight years old, and you know what? I didn't understand it. And here I am, soon to be 55, in like two weeks. Whoo! Nick, don't laugh. You're <laughs> going to get there too. 55. And you know what? I still don't understand what he did to me that day. 18 years old, he calls me to the ministry. I have no idea what that was all about. I still don't know what, what that's all about. I'm, befuddles me. But there was a desperate need at eight years old. And I needed to seek Jesus. I needed to know who he was. And I was desperate. And we might disguise sometimes that as a religious curiosity. Or I just need to seek this out a little bit. But you know, deep down, seated, his need was that he needed to know who Jesus Christ was. Take everything. It had nothing to do with his religious convictions or what was right for him that day. Or you know what? I'll let the, maybe just, I'm just not feeling good today. Maybe it's just a little bit of anxiety. Maybe I can get me some anxiety drugs and this thing will pass. I don't know how many people are on anxiety drugs because they're ignoring Jesus Christ. There's probably a lot of us, you know. The bad thing about drugs, regardless if they give them to you in a bottle from a doctor or you buy them on the street from somebody, they cloud your thinking. Sometimes, you know what we have to do? And I ain't knocking people that go through it. I'm gonna, I'll be honest with you. I've had about, be in the ministry long enough, you'll battle anxiety and depression. But you know what had to happen? I need to come clean with God in my mind and allow Him to be my first attack upon these things that happen to me. Even if you're here with a physical condition. I'm not saying you don't go to the doctor and get the help from the doctor, but you know the first person you need to go to? You need to go to Jesus Christ. He can heal things that doctors can't figure out. Brother Andrew's uh, father is a testament to that. You think doctors could have figured out what was going on with him and fixed that? Only God can really heal us. He had a desperate need, and we may not understand it. We might not even realize it, but our greatest need right now, today, is if you're not here here, you're not saved, it's Jesus Christ for salvation. That's your greatest need. If you're here and you're saved, your greatest need is to start growing up into the, your Christian walk. Yep. He saves us to grow. No one is saved to sit on the sidelines and not do anything. Right. You want to know if your Christian walks right? Look around you and, and, and see what you're doing for others. Is this, is this focus of my Christian walk now finally away from me and my needs and looking at other people's needs? Now you're walking a Christian walk because you're looking at the needs of others. Am I willing to put people above myself? Am I willing to put the ministry above myself? Am I willing to put what Jesus has called me to do above myself? Now you're on the right track as a Christian. But you can't even get to that track unless you know him as personal Savior. Because right. your way of thinking won't even match that. Um, we're a selfish people and we're always going to think about ourselves first. No one else can, could have helped Zacchaeus that day. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the world will tell you there's all kinds of ways to get to heaven. There's all kinds of ways to deal with stress. There's all kinds of ways to deal with your anxiety. There's all kinds of ways uh, to make God happy. Um, 
what might be right for me, you know, it may not, it, it, it may not be right for Brother James. You know, Brother James, you just go off and you just find out what you need to do for yourself and I'll do what I'll need to do for myself. And there's nothing that is further from the truth. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. There is one answer to get to God, to, to, to take care of these spiritual problems, and it's Jesus Christ, and it's through the name of Jesus that we must be saved. Here's a beautiful thing. This is not Scott's theology. It's not Hallelujah Side Baptist theology because this church has started, what, January? We haven't been an organized church very long ago. These are truths that are eternal truths from God the Father himself that he has given to us and handed down from the apostles' doctrine, from Jesus to the apostles down to us. And they're as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. There is one way to God. It's Jesus Christ. Any other way is going to lead to destruction. And you know what? You're an enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. He had a desperate need. How desperate is the need? Jesus is the only one who can save our soul. He's the only one that can make a difference on where we spend our eternity. At the end of verse 3, he talks about he was a man of little stature. And he, was, he could not get to Jesus because of the press. There were so many people there. He had a problem. He had obstacles in his way. It was between him and Jesus. So with all the money that he had, and all the power and all the prominence he had, he still had to overcome great obstacles. You know, it's amazing to me that I don't see anywhere in those scriptures where his money got him closer to Jesus. I don't see anywhere in those scriptures where his Rome, the connection to Rome that he had got him any closer to Jesus. What I see is obstacles. And what that tells me is the world is going to create obstacles between you and God. And your money can't buy you out. Why is that? Because you know why? Because money's of this world. Now, I'm not trying to say that because there's things of this world uh, that we need to survive. And the Bible doesn't say that it's, it's, it's wrong to take part in some things of the world. We have to have money to be able to buy and things like that. We have to have food to eat. Things, grocery stores, you know, aren't the devil. They're good to go to to eat, you know. Um, McDonald's five times a week might be the devil. I don't know. But <clears throat> you know what? But the problem was when we put our faith in these things above God, they're not going to get us to God. They're a temporary thing. The problem that this little man had is to get to Jesus, he was going to have to overcome obstacles. I'm here to tell you today that as a person, that if you're seeking Jesus for salvation, he's convicting you. There might be obstacles. We're going to talk about those. If you're a Christian and you think that the road is nice and smooth and you're never going to have anything to pop up in your way, you're wrong. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be obstacles. Here's the other thing that God doesn't do, and I can tell you this. You take it from a guy that's been preaching a long time. He does not come down and tell you how everything's going to work out. Never has. And there's things I popped up and said, there's no way we can do that. Or there's, Lord, there's no way. And, but it comes down to this. Are you going to put your faith in me? Will you put your faith in me? And you get to this step. You know what he does? Okay, you're going to put your faith in me. And it never ends. You're going to have to continue to put your faith in me. You have to continue to depend upon me. And the first, uh, one of the first obstacles the Bible says was the press. I don't like crowds. I get a lot of people, I, I got to get out in the open. People pressed against me. It's like, you know. Uh, and Robin's been with me. Got to step outside. Too many people, you know. Um, the people, the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was a little man, a short man. He could not see over the crowd that was between him and Jesus when he went by. And it made me wonder when I was reading this about the crowds in our lives. How many people, our friends or families, are keeping us from seeing Jesus? Is the crowd keeping you from serving Jesus? Who's the crowds in your life? Is it family? You know, it's amazing to me how people that can come in the eyes and the, and the disguise of friendship and even family can be an obstacle to us, to Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus says something profound a couple times. Uh, there was one time he was talking, his brothers and his, his mother were outside and they said, hey, your, your brother's outside, your mother's outside. And he pointed around to his apostles and he goes, um, these are my mothers. These are my brothers. Another time he talked about uh, if you're not willing to forsake family and things like this, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And man, those are, are profound things. But you know what he was saying? Don't let the crowds get in your way of our relationship. Because you know what? There's no other relationship in your life that's going to be more important than the relationship to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you that I probably have everybody in the world, and I've told her this, and I really believe this to be true, that I love my wife more than anyone in the world, 
even her mom and dad. Her mom and dad might say, oh, no, no, but I really believe that. And I think God brings a man and a wife together with, but you know what? I don't love her as much as Jesus did. And it would be a lie for me to try to convince her that I do. As a loving husband, the first thing I'm going to do as a minister and her husband is, you know what? You put Christ before me. You know what that does to our marriage? Makes it better. Um, it's made her a good wife for ministry. Uh, if you ever decide, if you're here and you're not married and decide to marry a preacher, understand their sacrifice. And there's times she's had to sacrifice of herself for me to go do something else. And she does it with a smile because you know why? She understands where God is in our marriage. And he's blessed that. Um, but there was, are there crowds in our life? Are there family? Are there friends keeping us from seeing Jesus? Uh, he's more valuable than any friend we're ever going to have in the world. There are others who allow some backslidden hypocrites in the church to keep them away from Jesus. Have you met them? I don't go to that church because there's hypocrites there. You know what? They're staying away from Jesus because of the crowd. Jesus never said, you know what? Don't go to that church because there are hypocrites there. What he said is, you need to serve me through a New Testament church. I'm going to be, I'm going to be blatant and honest. If you're here and you're saved and you're not participating and, and um, you haven't uh, made the choice to become part of a New Testament church, that's not pleasing to God. You're allowing the crowd to stay in your way. If, uh, if you choose not to be baptized because there's, there's sin in your life that you know I can't be baptized because there's sin in my life, you know what you need to do? You've got to come clean with God and get rid of that sin. Right. And here's the thing. It's not any different for me. I can't stand up to you as a minister and practice things of this world and call myself a minister of a God because he holds, he holds me to a standard. And he expects me to live to it. If you're a child of God, there's a standard he expects you to live to, too. And it's not, here's the amazing thing. It's nothing to you. You might say, well, preacher, that's none of your business. You're right. But it is God's business. Right. And here's the thing. He's called me to be his spokesperson. So guess what? <laughs> you got to hear me anyway. So get used to it because I'm not going to back off. Okay. Anyway, don't allow the crowd to keep you from God. I've heard that. There's, there's hypocrites in that church. Well, everybody here has been guilty of being a hypocrite. Have you ever acted like something you're not? Okay, guess what? You're guilty of being a hypocrite. When you stand before the Lord, he's going to say, why didn't you serve me? Because of the hypocrites in the church, Lord. He's going to ask you this. Are you saved? Yes. Are you my child? Yes. But you live like the world? Yes. Well, guess what? You're a hypocrite. Yep. He expects you to be part of the New Testament church. Don't allow the crowd to keep you away. May I say... Uh, that no loose living, cold hearted, wicked church member is worth going to hell over. And you know what? There are going to be loose living, wicked church members. That's right. They're not worth going to hell over. Yep. Get right. I want to just get right with God. If there's things in your life that are prohibiting you from having that ultimate relationship with God, and I'm going to tell you as a person that's sinned against God, that's been in positions where I was openly disobedient to Him, trust me when I say this from, from, a, from an experience of my own self. It is much better to be in good, good terms with him. He will make your life abundant in so many ways. Please don't let the crowd stand in your way. Zacchaeus had another problem. It was his condition. He had a personal problem that kept him from getting close to the Lord. Has been stated here. He was a short man, couldn't see over the crowd. <clears throat> don't let any of your physical conditions or anything that you perceive yourself to be keep you from having a relationship with God. He climbed up in that tree that he could see the Lord. Don't let your physical conditions, don't let your health conditions, you know what? I don't care what you have going on in your life, if you have health issues, whatever, uh, things that you see as obstacles. The things that are obstacles in, the, in this life are things that God can use to show his greatness and his glory. Right. Trust him with your situation. Trust him with your condition. Trust him with how he made you. Allow him to do a work in your life. Even though he had a problem, he was persistent. Verse 4 tells us this, And he ran before and climbed into the sycamore tree and see him, for he was to pass that way. I see this little guy with short legs running faster than anybody. We've got a cat. Her name is Beppo, and she has got short legs, and she moves faster than any creature I've ever seen. She had Zacchaeus legs, but she had four of them. I don't think Zacchaeus had four legs. But he ran before the crowd and he climbs up into a tree to get a glimpse of the Lord as he passes that way. A little man allowed nothing, not the crowd, not the condition to stand before him and see in Jesus. The first thing in his mind, the thing that was the most important, I've got to see Jesus. Are we that way as a church? Man, anything going on in our life, let's just drop it all right now because you know what? We need to serve Jesus. We need to see Jesus. We need to spend some time with Jesus. 
When you get during your day, do you take time just to spend some time with Jesus? Mm -hmm. As a Christian, you don't want that door's open. Yep. Um, and how much time do we spend? What about you? Do you care enough about the condition of your soul to pay whatever price is necessary to be right with him? He probably looked ridiculous. Do you think this little short guy climbed up a tree that people were like, what's he doing? Is he crazy? <clears throat> are you willing to make that sacrifice? Are you willing to turn from whatever little sins or pet sins you may have in your life and your stubbornness, you don't want to lay down that pride? Our sin's based on pride. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. Yep. You're willing to lay that down. Has a, if you're here and you don't know Christ, if that pride is between you and Him, you're not going to get saved. You got to give it. If you're here and you're a child of God, but that pride has crept back up in your life, He can't use you for service. You've got to turn that pride loose and that sin loose. Lay it down. Walk away from close friends. Uh, it's amazing to me, there have been people that come and go in our lives that I consider friends that if they called me today, I would still be there for them. But what's happened... There's certain relationship that God has moved Robin and I away from. But you know what? He moved us away for a reason. Because he had something else for us to do. And, and are you willing to walk away, even from close friends, if it means, you know what, I have to do this because I, the Lord has something he wants me to do. I can tell you experience from experience, again, that Jesus Christ is far worth that price. Uh, we've had relationships in our life of people that have been friends of ours that, are, that like I said, if they called me to dad, I'd be there for them. He never did extinguish the friendship. Make that clear. But what he did, he moved us to a different area. He moved us to a different place. And that friendship might have cooled a little bit. But you know what? If they need me there to minister to them, I'd be there in a heartbeat. But you know what? The price to pay to do what Christ wants me to do is a lot, is a lot more worth it. He is worth any sacrifice. He's worth whatever it takes uh, to get right with him. And Zacchaeus climbs this tree. So we saw that we have a sinner that was seeking God. But there's also a seeking Savior. But unbeknownst to most religions in the world, unless the Lord is seeking you, mm -hmm. there is no salvation. Yeah. I can pray until the cows come home, until there's a total eclipse of the sun, the earth is shaking, the Lord's coming back, Lord, save me, save me, save me, save me. I'm begging you. And if he's not seeking me, there's no salvation. And we're going to see what the Bible says about that. Um, notice that he climbs up in the tree. Let's read verse 5. And it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down to me, for I must abide at thy house. So here's Zacchaeus, and he climbs up in the tree. Notice that's his works he's doing. Up in the tree I go, and I'm going to look down, and Jesus says, Come on down. Come down from your high place. Get down here on this level. We have to come, even though that his intentions are right to get up to that tree to see Jesus, Jesus says, Come on down. I'm coming to your house today. The requirement isn't that, Kias, that you climb that tree and you do all these works to be saved. The requirement is, is I come to your house. Mm -hmm. There's a great truth in what he's saying there. Sinner, Jesus might only knock on your, your door one time. He might only enter your life one time. That's the time of opportunity yep. that you need to sit down and commune with him and take care of the sin problem. And he says, I'm coming to your... And he said, make haste. This is immediate. This is urgent. This is something you need to take care of right now. Get down of your, even your intentions were good, but you know what? Climb that sycamore tree if not what saved Zacchaeus. Allowing the Lord into his house and surrendering to him was what saved Zacchaeus. There are more uh, than one person seeking something that day. Zacchaeus was seeking to see Jesus. Jesus was seeking souls to save by his grace. Amen. This is always a combination that's going to be effective. When the sinner is seeking Christ and Christ is seeking them, it's going to be effective. I can sit there and preach and witness to somebody till my face turned blue and if the Lord's not dealing with them, you know, you plant a seed and you trust that the Lord will deal with them. Jesus comes to him, notice that. And um, go to John chapter 6, verse 44 with me real quick. We'll read that, what, what the Bible says. <clears throat> I've had people tell me they have not, when, and I, the conviction of God was upon them, and they'll say, I am not ready uh, to be saved. I'm not ready to make that commitment. I'm not ready to do that. Notice what the Lord says. John chapter 6, verse 44. No man come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus makes it clear. When that day of salvation comes, you're drawn because God's allowed it to happen. He's allowed the Holy Spirit to convict you. 
He's allowed you to be ready for salvation. And this, this, this mindset that you don't want, it's not right for me today. I'll take care of it next week. Well, next week may never come. Yep. The Bible is, is, is adamant that you don't want salvation is of God. You're called of God. You're convicted of God. You're saved by God. You're sealed by God. You're raised on the last day by God. There's nowhere in where the Zacchaeus or Scott Chadwick or Andrew Tony or anybody's name is mentioned other than God's. By the power of the Holy Spirit through the works of Jesus Christ. Jesus had to come to him. And when he said, make case come down from that tree. Um, he's offering a dead sinner life. The Bible teaches in, in, in John chapter 6 verse 65. It talks about that. There is no other way for a soul to be saved according to the Bible. We are all dead in sin until Jesus saves us. That's right. we, are, we are dead. Uh, we cannot save ourselves. And we, we certainly can't make ourselves alive. Um, Think about this. If Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, doesn't show us our need, we never would recognize it ourselves anyway. We live in our sin. Yeah. It takes the Holy Spirit of God, who's holy and righteous, to take and put into a sinner that we're inadequate. Because yeah. we're filled with pride. We think we're okay. Uh -huh. The Bible teaches, you know what, Jesus has to come to us and he has to, he has to reveal to us that we are in a sinful condition. That's our chance to say, you know what, Lord, here, here's repentance. I agree with you. I've had a change of heart. I don't want to be this way anymore. And that was Zacchaeus' attitude. Make case, come down from the tree. I'm coming to your house today. Jesus considered him. So we see in verse 5. Zacchaeus, make case and come down. For today I must abide in thy house. He considered him. When Jesus stopped under that tree that day, he knew everything there was to know about Zacchaeus. You realize that? I don't know. The Bible never said they ever met. He knew everything he needed to know about him before he ever got underneath that tree. Yeah. Me as an eight-year-old, you at the time that you were saved, before that moment of conviction, he knew everything there was to know about you. He knew every sin you were, you've ever committed. He knew every idle thought you had that wasn't honoring to him, which is every thought before you're saved. He knew everything about you. He had the numbers of your head counted. Everything there was to know about you, he knew. And he knew exactly what you needed just as he came under that tree that day. To me, that shows not only did he know that about me, about Zacchaeus, about, about you, that he knew it. What gets me about that, he was still willing to save us, even though he knew all the dark, dirty things. Wow. What a picture of grace. Yeah. If that was you under that tree and you're totally righteous, you're probably going to say, ah, that guy, he's a tax collector. He's abusing people. What a horrible person. And yet Jesus stops and says, I'm coming to your house today. Yeah. What a picture of grace. Jesus knows everything there's to know about you. And you know what? He still loves you. Yeah. I don't think anybody can look at ourselves and say, hey, I'm the apple of God's eye. Woohoo! Me and Jesus. Like I've heard some people actually say things like that. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> he knows everything about you, but guess what? He'll still save you by grace. Yeah. There's not something that you can do that's so vile that he wouldn't come and see you. God sees the true state of our hearts. Go with me real quick to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. We're going to get uh, old Zacchaeus saved here in a little bit. We're not, but the Lord is, but we're going to see that here real quick. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. This was actually when Samuel was going to anoint the next king of Israel. It was a fellow named by the name of David. There's so much truth in this. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not at his countenance or at the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for the Lord, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Man, mm -hmm. Lord don't look at the outward appearance. He didn't look at anything about Zacchaeus. He looked at the need of the heart. Yep. And the need of the heart, dead in sins, drove Christ to compassion. I'm going to make him alive. God looks and he sees the true state of our heart. Not only did he... he uh, call him and not only did he consider him uh, um, I'm jumping ahead of myself not only did he uh, have a desire to meet him and he considered him but Jesus also called him Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem we touched on that before he was going to die for the sin of the world but he was he said he had time to stop and reach out to one little wicked man and that's what Calvary was all about you know everybody talks about the uh, he died for the sins of the world and he, and he did this and he did that and, and I like to make it more personal you know what he died for that one little wicked man. Yep. When I hear this, 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 this universal idea, 
you know, that eventually everybody will be saved and come under the grace of God. And, and basically we're all like a bunch of little robots and, and, and whatever. And, and you know what? He had an eight-year-old boy who stands before you as a grown man now on his mind on Calvary. He died for me for that eight-year-old sins. He died for your sins. He could call you by name and every sin you did when he was on Calvary. And he gave up his life and he gave up... Uh, his, his being, he gave up being separated from God and being torn away and being, and, and being punished and suffering because you were on his mind. He called him. Jesus on his way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. He stopped and he reaches out to Zacchaeus once again what grace that he had. Who was Zacchaeus that Jesus cared about? He was a sinner. But the Lord loved him just like he loves the sinners in this room. We see here that it was an urgent call. Remember what Jesus said? Make haste. It's urgent. Come the day the Lord uh, may... Uh, I'm going to come. Death may come, but it's urgent today because there's no, there's no assurance after today. Salvation is something that's not to be played around with. It's the most important decision you're ever going to make. You need to be sure you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You need to be sure that you're saved. And there's some things we're going to hit real fast as we wrap this up about things that you can look at yourself and examine yourself with. Am I saved? Has this event happened to me? Because one thing we know, that's an unmistakable call. I want to reiterate that. Salva being called to salvation is unmistakable. God doesn't leave you doubting. Well, I wonder if it really, what's going on here? Doubt arises in us. But we're going to find out some things we can look at. I'm sure Zacchaeus knew the Lord was looking for something more than a place to visit that day. Whew, I'm tired. I need to come to your house to take a load off. Jesus was interested in one thing. He was after his heart. He wants to save you by his grace and his power. So we had, we had a, a seeking sinner, we had a seeking savior, and we had a spectacular salvation. We'll close it out in verses 6 through 10 of Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verses 6 through 10. And he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. Man, Zacchaeus got down that tree faster than he got up in that tree. Gravity is a wonderful thing. He got down, he made haste, he, and he received him joyfully. He was so overtaken by the grace of God that he received it and he was happy to do it. He was joyful. And when they saw it, they all murmured saying that he was gone to be a guest with this man, such a sinner. There's the people. There's the crowd. This Jesus is supposed to be so good and he's going to go have, uh, make, uh, be a guest with this sinner? What's wrong? What's going on here? Um, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything... From any man by false accusation, I restore it for him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to thy house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is to come and seek and to save that which was lost. What a spectacular Amen. salvation. I want to notice something about Zacchaeus. The crowd didn't bother him anymore. Do you notice he was fighting through the crowd and all of a sudden... Jesus is going to go have, he's going to have communion. He's going to sit down with that sinner. And Zacchaeus is so removed from that. And he is so caught up in Jesus. And praise God that Jesus will sit down and commune with sinners. Because all of us would be in a world of hurt if he didn't. Yeah. Jesus made a, a comment to the Pharisees when they made a comment like that. He said that he had come uh, for those that had the need, for those that were sick. And he told the Pharisees, you know, you're righteous. You don't need me. He was being very facetious. You don't need me. I come for those that are sick. I come for that sick little eight-year-old boy that needs me. I've come for um, that soon-to-be preacher's wife that needed me. I come for that, that uh, soon-to-be preacher who blasphemed my name and was drinking, and I'm going to save his. So I come for them. You're right, he came to commune with sinners. I praise God that he did, because we would be in a world of hurt without him. And we want to know, well, how do I know, Scott? Do we know that Zacchaeus was really saved, or was it just an emotional experience? You know what? He was saved. And here's some things about you and you can recognize. So we wonder sometimes, how do you know someone's saved? How do we know if I'm saved? We, we, we get in, and Satan plays this. There's a few things that are going to happen. I believe this wholeheartedly. When a child is born, they begin to, to start on milk and things like that. And then they start to grow and they, they uh, mature and, and things happen in their life. I think a spiritual condition of a newborn baby, you're going to start seeing some similar things. First thing you start to see is that his attitude had changed. In verse 6, Zacchaeus gladly received his Savior. His salvation is revealed by three very significant things he does after that, after he receives him. 
The very first thing was obedience. Is there a time in your life when Jesus Christ called you to salvation and you were obedient to that call? Strip everything back. Well, Scott, I've done this, I've done that. Wait, wait, wait. Let's go back to the moment. Did he call you to salvation? Were you convicted of your sins? Did you know you were a sinner and he called you to salvation and were you obedient to that call? If you haven't had that experience, I'm here, you never were saved. There's not this, I grew into salvation. I just always believed. There's a moment, there's a historical point in your life that Jesus convicted you of your sins and you were obedient to that call. It's clear in the Bible. Did that happen to you? His heart opened. He freely gave himself to Jesus. Received him in. This must be done before salvation can ever become a reality. When he's at, at your heart and, he, and he, he wants in and he wants to be a part of that, you have to open up your heart. Uh, you can never be saved unless you have opened your heart to him and allowed him in. He has obvious joy. The Bible says he's overjoyed at the opportunity to be with Jesus. Joy is always a byproduct of genuine salvation. Did you go through it and say, well, it wasn't no big deal? I was eight years old and I was ecstatic and had no reason to know why I was ecstatic for. There is such a burden of sin that's released from you at that time. Have you? It's not, trust me, it's not an emotional thing. It's beyond our understanding. It's something changes and you know it and you feel it from the, from the inside out, not from the outside in. The, this burden, and, and all of a sudden this burden is lifted and there's obvious joy. It's a byproduct of salvation. Uh, joy is one of the fruits of the, of the uh, Spirit of God. Yep. You'll start experiencing the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, Long-suffering, joy, love, and all these things that the Bible mentions. He will give you joy that you cannot describe and cannot be duplicated anywhere in the world. It's an everlasting joy. When, you, when your joy is placed and is based on things other than Jesus, that joy passes away, but this joy doesn't pass away. However, when Jesus is the source of his joy, it abides forever. I want to notice something that he did too. His actions revealed, not only did his heart change, but his actions started changing. That's what he says, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore for him fourfold. It's funny because people, the crowd are saying, you're having communion. You're dealing with this lost man, this sinner. And Zacchaeus said, Lord, I'm going to give to the poor. Everybody that Zacchaeus had cheated in taxes, he was willing to pay back and pay back with interest. Yep. I've had people come to me that have done things in their life and they said they've repented, but there's no actions to go back and repay the people that they've hurt. I have a firm belief that if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you, you'll see a byproduct of their actions because you know what? They're going to right the wrongs they did. Not, not for their salvation, but because they were saved. Yeah. Not only did he want to pay these people back, he wanted to pay them back with interest. Yeah. Because God had overwhelmed him so much. You know what? This money and this stuff that I've been cheating people out of, that I've been stealing from, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm going to give it back to him. I'm going to give it back. But here's what, what's going to happen. Now that he's saved, God's going to make him a witness. How much better of a witness can this tax collector be? This, okay, the tax collector is tax collectors giving back money. State of Ohio or the United States government, do they do that? No. <laughs> they haven't been saved. <laughs> so it's an unmistakable call that opens your heart, causes you to be obedient, give, obedient gives you obvious joy, causes you to do things that are uncharacteristic, a tax collector giving back money with interest. Zacchaeus in verse 7 and 8 repents of his sins. Those are two absolute proofs of salvation, both in his, his life and your life. Have you repented? Have you had a point in your life that you were going down a certain road, you were convicted of your sins, and you had a change of heart? I see things this way. I see things through my perspective. Now all of a sudden, you know, I have a change of heart. I see things through God's perspective. I'm a new creature. I've been born again. It's changed in my actions. I want to do things I never even considered doing before. And then Satan turns the heat up on you. Then it gets fun. There was a confession. Until you come to a place where you're willing to call out God and confess your sins, you can never be saved. If there's not confession, not to a priest, not to a pastor, not to a deacon, not to mom, not to dad, until there's confession... To God for your sins there cannot be salvation you have to come clean with God of who you are I had to come clean with God who I was there was a change 
2 Corinthians verse 5 or chapter 5, excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When Jesus comes in, he always brings a changed life. I'm going to say that again. When Jesus comes in, he always brings a changed life. If your life doesn't change, you need to go back to that point. Did I really receive Jesus? And if I did, how come I didn't follow him after that? There's a problem there. If there's not a changed life, there's a disconnect between you and God. The Bible says, we just read it, I make all things new. I make this tax collector who was a cheat get people back and pay him money back and pay him interest. He was at Zacchaeus was redeemed with a great salvation. Verse 9, Jesus confirms it. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to thy house for as much as ye also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Jesus shows his mercy. He took a little wicked man and in one instant saved him forever. Sure. Do you realize here that all of us here that are saved, we're spiritual children of Abraham. He was the father of the faith. And all the blessings that were open to Abraham, I will curse them to curse you, I will bless them to bless you, are open to his New Testament church. We are sons of, of God. We are spiritual descendants of Abraham. We are no different than Zacchaeus. He tucked this little man and forever changed his life, and it had instant results by him wanting to pay back those things that he stole. That promise is available for all those who come to Jesus by faith. Eternal salvation becomes yours and mine through him. It's personal. It belongs right. to me. It's a gift. He's given it to me. It belongs to me. It's funny. When you receive things that are so valuable, you've got valuable things in your house. I bet there's things in your house. There's, it's funny. There's things that we place different things of value on. Not so much monetary. We have things that belong to Robin's grandfather, uh, things that belong to my mother. You know, we take really good care of those things. You know, they're reminders, and they're good. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you know what? They're temporal. And it doesn't really represent the person that, that they're here with us, but it's just things that remind us of, things that were important to them. Do we do that with our salvation? That gift of salvation, man, do we take care of it? Do we allow it to, to change our lives, to allow it to let us grow, to allow it where God can look upon us and say, I'm really pleased with the, the life? We see that the, the mercy of Christ when he says, your household has saved the day. But also, we also see something else that he said. We see the mission of Christ. I love this scripture, verse 10. We're going to close with this one. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus reminds us all that he came here for one reason. He came here to save sinners. That's, right. That's his mission today. That was the reason the New Testament church was founded. That's the reason he established it. He is still saving souls today, just like he did that day with Zacchaeus. Um, he's coming again. He's got another mission called the second coming. That mission is not to save souls. But that mission is to judge those that have rejected him. He's going to set up a kingdom. The clock's ticking. He's given us 2,000 years to understand this and to get it, to get on board and to understand it. So my challenge today, a couple things. Do you want to be part of that mission? Do you want to seek and save that which is lost and bring people to Jesus Christ? We're part of that mission yep. to introduce people to Christ. If you're here and you're not saved, do you want to make a change? Do you really want to seek? I'm talking about a real salvation, something that makes you change, something that's going to make you go out and pay back people that you cheated over the years or whatever, something that drives you to change. If you're here and you are saved, but you know, you know what, things just aren't right. I'm still not being filled. Are you willing to turn loose of the sins and the crowds, and the things that are in your life that are keeping you from serving God? Because here's the key. If you're serving God, you'll serve others. Yep. I think we're all in agreement that Jesus Christ was the greatest man that ever walked the face of the earth. My works as his minister should mirror what he did. I should be willing to give myself for the good of others, even if it meant my own life, to carry out the gospel. And just because he called me to preach or called Brother Andrew to preach, you know what? <clears throat> he expects the same thing out of all his children. He expects everything. He expects, are you willing to give? And here's the, here's the, the, the neatest part about this. It's really not that much sacrifice. He abundantly fills you so much with what you need to carry out the mission, your cup will run over. 
Sleep like a baby. And I remember, Robin can, how long does it take me to go sleep at night? Two seconds. Two seconds. I sleep like a baby. You know what? I go to sleep with a clear conscience. And not because I'm so good. I've been set free by the master. He came and sought me, just like he said, and he saved me, and he set me free from my sin, and now I can live without guilt anymore. If you're here and you're saved and you're still living by the guilt, let the guilt go. He's forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Get busy. Get on with it, man. Do what God wants you to do. He's not going to call you to do what he's called me to do. He may not call you to do what Brother Andrew is called to do, but you know what? It's funny because him and I are ministers, but he's called us to do different aspects of his work. Sure. You know what? He's called you to do something. And we're going to support you in whatever that is to help you and, and to do whatever we can do because, you know, we want to see you be successful with God. We want you to have that relationship, man, that I have no guilt left. Do you know deep down inside today something's missing? I want you to know that Jesus is exactly what you need. If you come to him, as he passes by, he's going to take care of what you lack. But you've got to take advantage of it when he passes by.